We're going to look at Romans chapter 11, verse 25. Romans chapter 11, and we will read verse 25 through 29. Verses 25 through 29. The thorn on the, th uh, the, thorn on the side against replacement theology is Romans chapter 11. Now, some of you might go, what is replacement theology? Replacement theology, what that is, is that they believe that the Christian church has replaced Israel. We believe that's false. We believe that Israel and the church are separate entities. They will claim that the church is spiritual Israel. But you got to understand this. Israel as a physical nation is not gone. As a spiritual nation, they may be gone. So they're not spiritual Israel. We are. But the physical nation of Israel is still not gone. It's still ongoing. Now, Romans chapter 11 proves it. But replacement theology, they know this infamous passage. So they're going to try to debunk it. I'm going to explain our side first for those of you who don't know. And then I'm going to explain how replacement theology tries to debunk it. Romans 11.25, we know physical Israel is not done because the Bible says, for I will not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. So don't be ignorant. Why? Lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. That what? Blindness in part has happened to Israel. So it's only in part, partially. It's not complete. Is happened to the nation of Israel until when? The fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So notice that Israel is temporarily cut off temporarily it's until some time at the future it's not permanent look at verse 26 and so notice all israel shall be saved look at that so notice the nation of israel will be saved keep reading as it is written there shall come out of zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from jacob look at that the deliverer god is going to turn away that ungodliness from israel jacob see that's physical israel that can't be the church for this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. He's going to take away their sins. Verse 28, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. So notice the Jews are considered enemies. Why? Concerning the spiritual side, the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you're a physical Jew, you are spiritually lost, a spiritual child of Satan, and you need to get saved just like every other race and nation who has not received Christ for salvation, they are a spiritual child of the devil. They are enemies for your sakes. But look at the physical side. As touching the election, they are beloved for the, notice this, the father's sake. See that? They're forefathers, physical side. They're considered beloved by God. So the physical side is still ongoing. It's only the spiritual side that they have no part with. The spiritual side, it's the physical, that's still ongoing. So that's why we believe in an important doctrine called dispensationalism. Dispensationalism means we divide verses to the right group of people and right time periods. Because if you don't do that, you're going to combine all the verses together and come up with major wrong doctrines. So one of the important divisions we make, a main thrust in dispensationalism, is dividing Israel from the church. Now... What you got to understand is that Stephen Anderson, Tex Mars, and replacement theology, they're familiar with this argument. So this is what they'll attempt to argue. What they're going to attempt to argue is that when it's talking about in verse 26, all Israel shall be saved, they're talking about this way. There's going to be Jews or Israel who's going to convert to the church they're going to convert into Christianity but the problem is it says all Israel right all Israel so that doesn't make sense do we see all physical Jews converted to Christianity no in fact this is true if you do wit a lot of soul winning one of the hardest people to ever win to Jesus Christ to the church to salvation is Israel they're the one of the furthest people away from that so that doesn't make sense so this is how they get around this. How they get around this is, is that all of them can't convert to Christianity. So what this means is that in verse 25, when it says, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. 
So until they put that particular time period as the tribulation. So the time period by context is tribulation. After the tribulation is over, God's going to cast unbelieving Jews into hell and the leftover Jews, they're the one that make up the nation of Israel, right? Thus, all Israel saved. That's his argument. That's his answer. So that's how they get around this passage. But then how do you get around verse 28? They are, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. Stephen Anderson and Replacement Theology argues, yes, we agree with the dispensationalists concerning the Christian gospel. They are enemies, and they are. But the second part is they reinterpret it this way. But as touching the election, they argue that this election is not Jews. It's concerning Christians. Because if you look at every, nearly every New Testament passage, nearly every New Testament passage in the Bible, the elect is referring to the Christian church. That's what they're going to argue, which is true. We don't deny many verses in the New Testament show the elect is referring to the Christian church. So as touching the Christian church, the election, they, the Jews, are beloved for the Father's sakes. So the Jews are beloved because of God the Father's sake. So in other words, Christians still love the Jews. So that's his answer. His answer is, is that they are our enemies, but we are supposed to love them. That's why the Bible says, love your enemies, Stephen Anderson will argue. Now, you know what's the simple debunking of that one is? Before I debunk that, let me give a simple debunking, debunking of Stephen Anderson. I'm not sure if I can say the rest of replacement theology, but Stephen Anderson in particular, you can easily debunk him by this. He believes that you can hate your enemies. He believes in hating enemies. He also says that love your enemies at the book of Matthew is not referring to lost people. It's referring to your personal enemy that you come across in life. So that verse he's using about loving the enemies at verse 28, he doesn't believe that himself. He's a liar. He's a hypocrite and a liar. He doesn't believe that. So you caught Stephen Anderson teaching contrary doctrines. So those of you who are watching and following and agreeing with Stephen Anderson, you better watch out. He, te he taught contradictory doctrines, but you didn't catch that? Why didn't you catch that? Because you weren't studying, were you? You were just listening like a robot and agreeing everything that he teaches. That's dangerous. That's a cultic church. If you come to this church with that kind of mindset, mindset, then you should not come to our church. That's a cultic church, and I'm a cultic leader. I made you all look at the verses and for you to study the verses because the Bible should be your authority, not this pastor. Because I could teach or say something that would contradict the Word of God. But apparently the people think Stephen Anderson is the Bible, so they're just going to listen to him. So he don't believe that. That interpretation is knocked out of the park. But not only that, here's another problem that he's going to have. If, <coughs> if you keep reading right here, it says they're not beloved because of God the Father's sakes. They're beloved for whose sake? The Father's, notice plural, sakes. It's not God the Father's singular sake, they're beloved. It's their physical forefather's sakes. They're still beloved by God. Thus, they're still beloved on their forefather's side. And notice, they are beloved for the Father's sake. Right? That phrase? What is it preceded by? A comma. The election. So, the election, comma, who's it referring to this election, comma, they are beloved for the Father's sake. In English grammar, that phrase would connect to the election. So thus, the for Father's sake, when they're beloved, they're connected to election. Thus, the elect is referring to Israel, not Christians, in this passage. Are Christians the elect? Absolutely. But how are they the elect? Spiritually. Israel's the elect how? Physically. That verse told you the election how? Physically. They are beloved for the Father's sake. Physically. Forefathers. Physical side. Come on. 
So now we see right here, Israel is the elect. That interpretation falls apart by context. But not only that, look at Matthew 24. Look at Matthew chapter 24. Look at this. I hope your hand's at Romans 11 still. I apologize. Keep your hand at Romans 11. We're going to go back there. But now go to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. We're going to look at verse 22. Verse 22. Matthew chapter 24. And we will read verse 22. Notice who the elect is. Now, Stephen Anderson they're, and Post Trivers, they're going to argue that the elect is referring to Christians and not Jews. Look at Matthew chapter 24 and verse 22. And except those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved. But for, notice, the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Notice the elect is mentioned here, and they will argue that's referring to the Christian church. No, Jesus is not talking about the elect, uh, the elect Christian church. He's talking about the elect Jews. Ooh, how do you know that? Well, look at verse 15. Simple. When he therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in where? The holy place. There's no such thing as a physical holy place for Christians unless you're like the Catholic Church. The holy place spoken by Daniel the prophet during the Old Testament, not New Testament. Thus you can guess that's referring to Israel, Jerusalem, the temple. But keep reading. So we know it's Judaism. It's talking about Jews in context. Look at verse 16. Then let them which be in where? Judea. Flee into the mountains. See that? The context is referring to Jews. Look at verse 20. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on what? The Sabbath day. Three times it showed you the context to be Jews. Three times. From verses 15 all the way down to verse 20. And then that's why verse 22 later on, the elect, right? must be referring to then what? Jews, by context. So that's pretty obvious. People who do not read the Bible, what do they do? They just read verse 22, make an assumption it's Christians. They, they blindly, I mean, if you were an honest Bible, sincere truth seeker, you would have read in chronological order, sequence, Matthew 24, the whole chapter. And if you started at verse 15, all the way down, before you hit verse 22, you would have thought those were Jews. A dishonest person who wants to teach his own heretical doctrine will skip all of that, deliberately find a verse 22, just jump to verse 22, and claim that that's referring to the Christian church. That's heresy. That's not a Bible truth seeker. So we see right here this Romans 11 is easily debunked when post-tribbers interpret that. Now go back to Romans 11. Here's another thing. So this is important right here. Now jump back to Romans 11. So if we follow that logic now of Romans 11 by context, look at this. Verse 28, we know that's physical side, correct? Correct. Here's another one. Verse 27. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. Wait a minute right here. God made a covenant with Israel that he will one day take away their sins. Not only that, you're going to find out that at verse 25, 26, it's a future time period. So sometime at the future, he made a covenant with Israel. And then verse 29, that's important. For the gifts and calling of God are without what? Repentance. God cannot change his mind on what he made a promise with Israel that he's going to restore them. They're not done. But this is a covenant he made with them. The gifts and calling are without repentance. Go back to Romans 11. And then look at the first, uh, excuse me, Romans 4. We have Romans 4. Look at this now. Romans chapter... Excuse me, I got the wrong chapter. Uh, it's going to be, let me find it real briefly right here. In the book of Romans, the Bible predicts right here that Israel is not done. Remember, the gifts and calling of God are without what? Repentance. And that's referring to Israel. 
Yes? Now look at Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. Look at verse 3. Romans chapter 9 and verse 3. Gifts and calling of God without repentance. Remember that. Gifts and calling of God without repentance. That's referring to physical Israel. And it's referring to physical Israel, nation, that is not definitely Christian church. I'm going to prove it right here. They're not saved Christians. Verse 3. For I wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren. My, Notice what Paul says. I wished I was damned, accursed, a lost person, damned. See, not a saved Christian. For my brethren, my who? Kinsmen according to the flesh. Jews. These aren't saved Jews. Jews converted to Christianity. This is totally opposite. These are physical Jews. But yet these physical Jews are what? Verse 4. Who are the Israelites. Thus, remember Romans 11, all Israel saved. But keep reading. Israelites to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the what? Covenants. Remember what God said in Romans 11? I made a covenant with them. Keep reading. And the giving of the law. Remember the gifts of God without repentance? Keep reading. And the service of God and the what? Promises. Gifts and calling of God without repentance. Remember that? Romans 11. What, what did he mean by that, gifts and calling? What he made with the physical nation of Israel. Verse 5, whose are the what? Fathers. Remember Romans 11, beloved, for the father's sake. So the context of the author right here in Romans 11 is referring to Jews, if you're an honest reader. And of whom as concerning the flesh. See that? It's all flesh. Christ came who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. So it's referring to physical Israel. Now they might argue that there's no way you can say all Israel in Romans 11 and the elect at Matthew 24 are referring to physical Jews. You know why? Because obviously those Jews have not received Christ for salvation. So how can you honestly say they're saved? The easy answer is this. What dispensationalism? Dispensationalism. Romans 11, what is it talking about? Future time period tribulation. They even admitted that, that it was tribulation. Matthew 24, what was the time period? Tribulation. See, that's like a duh statement. It's not today. Obviously, they're lost. Sometime at the future, the physical nation of Israel will be saved, you got to understand. It's going to be a mass revival, you must understand. You might say, how do you know that? Because Revelation 7 told you, 12 tribes of Israel only virgin males, only virgin males are 144,000. You can imagine like parents' side, children, and other people after that. So you see that? This is, the verses now make sense when you look at context and scripture with scripture.